today we are going to talk about Emmanuel Levinas. Uh, he's a very interesting phenomenon, he himself. So far we were talking about the leftists, but uh, we have arrived at uh, the uh, end of the 70s and now it is the 80s. Uh, and we see one by one the disappearance of those older figures which populated throughout the 60s and 80s and new figures uh, and Levinas is a very good example of it. He was, he was a Jewish philosopher, a religious figure and actually perhaps one can say that he was much more occupied with the questions of theology rather than philosophy, okay? He was a Jewish philosopher. And, uh, he was the first interested in the Husserlian phenomenology. Actually, his doctoral thesis was on the uh, on an analysis of the notion of intentionality in Husserlian phenomenology. And uh, later on, when he studied under Husserl, uh, began to be attracted by Heideggerian philosophy. And, uh, began to be a serious follower of Heidegger's thought up until that decisive year here, as in the book, Christian States, okay? 1933, when Heidegger associated with the Nazi party and accepted the rector rectorate of the uh, University of, what was its name? Freiburg, okay? Uh, from then on, it appears that this created a very serious disillusionment on part of uh, Levinas and he began to develop a philosophical reaction against Heideggerian phenomenology and not limiting itself, its critical attitude to that, uh, extending itself throughout all of the Western philosophy actually. Okay? And made a decisive turn actually. And uh, let me put it this, it was not only Levinas. You may remember, for instance, a Michel Foucault uh, writing uh, against humanism, writing against, uh, so to speak, anthropomorphism, etc., etc., was suddenly, uh, when the 1970s ended and turned uh, to the 1980s, we see a Michel Foucault talking, uh, advocating, talking about and advocating subjectivity, the reconstitution of the subject, either through ethical or aesthetical means, so on and so forth. And the others, Baudrillard, Lyotard, and some others as well had followed the suite. So there was a return to the religious themes as well as return to the forgotten or mocked out question of the ethics and ethical, okay? So even though Levinas was uh, active, uh, due, starting with the early 30s, Actually, he's coming to the foreground in the history of thinking. Um, actually, more, for the most part, I can say, also uh, to Derrida's writing throughout 1980s, okay? And Jacques Derrida, which was a post-structuralist at this time in 1960s, beginning to turn to be a Jewish philosopher as well uh, during the 1980s and late 1990s and 2000s, okay? So, actually, we are at the moment when postmodern critic had been exhausted itself, so to speak, okay? having left not much to say, uh, and the subject had been collapsed, and uh, we are facing a new desire to return back to, uh, uh, to the problem of the reconstitution of a meaningful world, okay, actually. <laughs> So, Levinas, being already active from the 1930s, turned out to be quite a popular figure starting with 1980s. And uh, actually, even today I can say that uh, today when Derrida had already been forgotten, I can say that the name of Levinas seems to be the only name which has been left to us to discuss. And it's quite popular and almost I can even say that 
Uh, it is the Levinasian thinking which uh, informs our contemporary discussions, including political and otherwise. Okay. So it would be a, quite an interesting ta task to take a look at what he has to say for us. Okay. First of all, let's say. Uh, even though his philosophical activity starts quite early, actually his most influential book came in 1961 with the title. When it came, it was not that influential, okay? It had been rejected by a certain publication houses, only finding uh, it, it's, it's for itself a place with the expensive editions of that Brill. Uh, uh, publishing books in Holland, okay? So the work, the title of the work, which came in 1961, was Totality and Infinity. Containing a subtitle, I'm looking for it. Uh, what was it? Şimdi bakın aklıma gelmedi abi anda. Contain the term exteriority, but what it was before that term, I don't remember right now, so I'm looking for it. So just give me a time. Is there anybody who remembers? I should telephone or check it out. Şimdi kağıt hazırlamıştım ama onu yukarıda unutunca bulamadım. Okay. Uh, something an X of exteriority as far as I remember. Exteriority. Okay, we are gonna take a rather short, short look actually. Mm, short look, not short look, we are gonna uh, a little bit detailed look at this totality and infinity, okay? Simply because it is the major work, later work, which sometimes had been interpreted as uh, a turn in Levinas thinking, comes uh, in 1970s uh, with the title Otherwise Than Being. which Levinas further develops his position in trying to solve uh, some problems which had already been embedded in totality and infinity, okay? So totality and infinity, actually, the major claim in totality and infinity was this. Actually, Levinas began to develop this uh, idea in early 1950s, but its most expressive and formulated uh, development takes place with this book, okay? The basic idea is quite simple, actually. Levinas insists that so far in Western thinking, what has been recognized as the first philosophy or metaphysics or ontology was primarily based upon the question of knowing, okay? The question of knowing, you know, remember, remember the first critic of uh, Immanuel Kant, for instance. It was, it was about the first critic. It was not by accident that it was the first critic. Okay? It was dealing with the question of cognition, knowing the world. You know, remember. And even you may remember a Descartes posing the problem of knowing. You know? <laughs> the first philosophy is about knowing. or metaphysics or ontology, okay, these are the alternative names uh, applied to this first philosophy, is about cogni cognition. For 
For instance, we have seen a critic of cognition, if perhaps the first critic of cognition understood as first philosophy, in the Heidegger's reaction against Husserl's phenomenology. You know, Husserl's phenomenology, let's remember, so it would be easier to understand what Levinas has to say to us. Okay, uh, Husserl's phenomenology was talking about an act of intentionality together coupled with an object of that in intentionality or for what he calls for consciousness. These two noesis and noema you know, together constitute the very structure of the consciousness. You know, but however, the primary problem was that all these acts of intentionalities was directly connected with the question of being aware, which we call consciousness, right? So the problem had already been set in the scenery of the consciousness. Now, a Heidegger was coming along and saying that, no, no, the understanding or the problem of consciousness can only be considered as just one among many of different kinds of intentionalities, okay? So actually, Daseins, in Heideggerian language, Daseins concernful dealings with the world far exceeds the limitations of understandings, okay? In each and every act of concernful dealings with the world may not contain the element of consciousness and understanding. Okay, that was the second point. And remember, all those thoughts locating the basic problem as cognition produced a certain idea of mind or consciousness. which in each and every case should be represented in the form of a totality. Hence the title totality, okay? <laughs> in the form of a totality. <laughs> and, uh, you know, even though Heidegger made a critique of this overemphasis of understanding or knowing in uh, all of the previous philosophy, actually, in the example of the Husserlian, thinking, okay, Heidegger himself was based uh, his analysis of Dasein on a certain notion of primordial understanding, okay. As we have seen uh, when we were discussing the Heideggerian thinking, okay, even before that articulated understanding came into the picture, Heidegger was talking about, say, the structure of equipmentality. He was talking about the appearance or showing itself up of a hammer in connection with this structure of equipmentality, which is produced by the concernful dealings of a Dasein. You know? But the problem is, how Dasein can know that that particular item falls into this structure of equipmentality and performs this or that function within this structure? Okay. Therefore, Heidegger had already been enforced uh, to say that Dasein had a primordial understanding of being. Okay. Even though this understanding is not articulated, or if you like, this, uh, this kind of understanding cannot be interpreted as if it had been elevated itself to being a knowledge, okay. Dasein understands the world. Now, therefore, Heideggerian ontology as well, or ontology general, according to Levinas, which was, who was so eager to make a critique of Heidegger, simply because he saw a connection between Heideggerian anti-humanist ontology and Heidegger's Nazist preferences, okay? And we are talking about somebody here in the person of knowledge who had lost almost all of his family to German Holocaust, okay, in the hands of Nazis. On the one hand, we have a supporter, actually this is a very strange and very rare occasion, two very closely influenced 
people, one on the side of the sufferers, the other on the side of those who inflict that sufferings. Okay. <laughs> so actually we can see this reaction uh, to Heideggerian thinking in this conflict. According to Levinas, Heideggerian phenomenology, when it is distancing itself from the human concern, and as well as it is overemphasized importance attributed to the question of being in the splendor of this being is actually falling into forgetfulness with this primary question of the relationship with the other human being. Okay. <laughs> Therefore, Levinas would insist that and would show us the reasons, philosophical reasons, why ontology should be overcome. <laughs> you know, actually, when we first approach the question, the question is simply this. How we come relate with our exteriority? Which is then what kind of question about exteriority or something like that? NSA on, NSA on exteriority, exactly. Thank you very much for this. You know, this is exactly an essay on exteriority. The question is this, how it is possible to be connected with our exteriority? Okay, that's that simple. But so far, as we have seen, so far, this turns out to be an impossibility. Okay, so far, everything revolves within our own being state of being aware. You know, remember that Kantian picture. It remains, it's stuck with us up until the end. Okay? That Kantian picture was this. That, that's the circle, that encapsulating, imprisoning circle which we call consciousness. Now, take a look at the elements of this consciousness. Okay? We were talking about sensibility. Okay? We were talking about understanding. We were talking about reason, okay? And within this, at the core of which we would find that so-called transcendental subject. Huh? Okay, let's ask, where is the world? Where is the exteriority? Okay? Or if you like, in uh, Levinasian terms, where is that fucking other? Huh? The other person, where is that? Okay, as you can see, if that is the case, the other person takes place here in a nominal world, okay, and can only make its appearance in the form of a phenomenon. And you know, this circle had also been crowded with the phenomena. Huh? And this total sum of phenomena would be named by Heidegger later on as the word. So this is why it's only Dasein who can have a world. Okay, simply because Dasein, as you see, it's state of awareness. It opens up a clearing in Heideggerian terminology, and things come to show themselves in this or on this clearing. Okay, this is the Dasein itself, a world created by Dasein by. Dasein's own dispersion onto the things, dispersion onto the things, it's scattering onto the things. It is nothing else than the very ecstasis, it's being outside of itself of Dasein. But outside of itself of Dasein does not mean that outside was capable of reaching out to its exteriority, okay, in this form of relationship. It means that. And Kantian philosophy thinking shows it is power here. It means that everything that makes its appearance here, okay, has somehow to be connected with Dasein or consciousness or subject or whatever this is. Okay. In other words, it means that if I see you, I see you not as you are, but I see you according to how I can see you. Hmm? So the image, my idea of you, has nothing to do with you in the ultimate analysis, but rather is something produced by my own self. Hmm? 
that's that's the totalizing effect, you know, uh, Levinas was about to talk about, right, to, to us, okay? I am totalizing that world according to me, myself, okay? And therefore, I tend to produce, according to my a priori structures of understanding, I tend to produce a concept for each and every other, whether this other is a human being or something else, each and every other a concept. And I come to conceive and represent in the form of an appearance, a phenomena, that other in me. Okay. And that other in me is formed according to me. Okay. So, <laughs> this other person here, <laughs> had been reflected in the form of an appearance or phenomena, but this reflection cannot be loyal to its origin. That was the point Levinas was directing his critique. Okay? And he was saying that if we stick to this, if we take this, the first step of our thinking about the relationship between ourselves and the world, okay, this will take us to a very dangerous point, as the Holocaust has already shown. Okay? Simply because this will take us to forget what the other human being is really stands for over there. Okay? That was the point, and I, I guess it has to be say, taken quite seriously, especially at that time when the unity of the subject had already began to be destroyed under the postmodern critic, okay? Now, it's not only under the postmodern critic. I, I don't want you to think that uh, I'm trying to lead you to a certain idea, emphasizing these was the ideas, discussions of those thinkers that had produced all these historical results, etc. No, no, my tendency is rather this, to see these discussions as the reflections of the conditions of their time. Okay, so what matters is especially from, for us from a sociological point here is that in this shift we have to see a certain transformation of the conditions in which we acquire our experiences. Okay, life, in other words, was changing, so to speak. Okay, the lives of the individuals, the possibility of certain sets of experiences had been changing. Okay. For instance, uh, I can count and I see the expression of those uh, development of those postmodern theories as our inability actually, our experience with regard to our inability to control our lives. The subject was no longer in control. Therefore, it had turned out to be the object of the critique. Okay? The subject was no longer that subject the Enlightenment on modernity was advocating. Okay? We were no longer capable of feeling ourselves as the real actors in history. That was the major point. Okay. okay. <laughs> so, it was under these conditions, actually, we have to take this Levinasian critic in a rather serious way, actually, okay? So, what Levinas presupposes instead of, okay, we criticize ontology as first philosophy. Actually, if I can find certain quotations. Okay, for instance, for Levinas, I am reading from Critchley, okay, page 16. For Levinas, the ontological event that defines and dominates the philosophical tradition from Parmenides to Heidegger consists in suppressing and reducing all forms of otherness by transmuting them into the same. Levinas would call this, this circle, as the same. You know, this circle is a very interesting circle. This circle is, at the same time, 
the very circle of consciousness, but at the same time of the world too, you know, in which you can find the subject and the objects in the form of phenomena. And that phenomena is nothing else than the Husserlian object for consciousness, as you can see. Okay? So this in its totality, so to speak, also has the capacity to dispose a distinction, okay, a distinction between subject and the object. So within this framework, that distinction between the subject and object actually is a distinction within the structure of the same. Okay? So that's why he calls this same, just to emphasize the unity or oneness of the object and the subject. Okay? So let me continue where I was at. Okay, here. In ontology, the other is assimilated to the same like so much food and drink. Or oh, digestive philosophy, as Sartre exclaimed against French neo-Kantianism. Taking up the analysis of separate existence in part two of totality and infinity, ontology is the movement of comprehension, which takes possession of things through the activity of labor, where conceptual labor resembles manual labor. Ontology is the like ontology is like the movement of the hand, the organ for grasping and sizing, which takes hold of print and comprehend things in a manipulation of otherness. In Transcendence and Hate, an article uh, written by Levinas, Levinas outlines and criticizes this digestive philosophy where the knowing ego is what he calls the melting pot of being, transmuting all otherness into itself. Okay? <laughs> As we will see this uh, from another approach, even we were discussing Jacques Derrida's thinking. Actually, what's at stake? That simple and social relationship. Okay, this is true and true social, actually not philosophical, as Levinas argues over there. It is whatever you call it does not make much difference. Okay, the if, for instance, you can put it as the relationship between I, me, and you. Or is the relationship between the self and the other? However, since this relationship had already been contained in the sameness of this totality, according to certain regulator principles which pertain to me or Dasein, uh, and remember, Dasein, in each and every case, my Dasein, okay? So, my rules, in other words, okay, according to my rules, have already been contained here, okay? I hear here the phenomenon of the other. Uh, and this phenomenon of the other is different from, if you like, let me put it in this word, different from the phenomenon of me or subject. has already been set here. Okay, so this Levinas would call as the other in me. Okay, it is the other in me here. However, that other is there, and one has to find out to establish the possibility of opening up of this self contained totality of the sameness to its exteriority. Okay, otherwise. Levinas thinks we would not be able to establish genuine social relationships. Okay. <laughs> so ethics in that sense is the name of that social relationship with the other. Now what does it contain? Okay. So Levinas supposes that actually th there is something in that ethical social relationship that exceeds the capacities of understanding, comprehending the other. Okay, that was the basic issue. 
You know, all our discussions, for instance, in relation to otherness, actually takes place within the framework of this relationship between self and the other, which had already been contained in the totality of the same. Okay. For instance, we can talk about Kurtz, but we can talk about, at least in public discussions, we can, we can only talk about Kurtz from the point of view of Turks. And Kurtz were talking about uh, the Turks, the same applies as well. They are talking about the Turk from the point of view of the Kurd. Okay, so the Turk in Kurd and the Kurd in Turk is at stake here. Okay. <laughs> Now, within ontology, you know, to be able to resolve this social problem, there has been suggested many, many alternatives, the last of which, and perhaps the most popular one, turned out to be the Gouldaud Hegelian notion of recognition. Mm. Mutual recognition, we come to, uh, to be able to cooperate, to be able to realize larger enterprises. We need to establish cooperation among ourselves. Therefore, to be able to achieve that cooperation, we come to a point where we are forced to recognize each other. Uh, so, the, out of this mutual recognition, we may establish a certain kind of equal relationship, decorating the rights, uh, decorating the servant with the rights, okay? So, positing, positioning the servant as if the servant equal to us, but forgetting that all is taking place within the total structure of the same. Therefore, even the terms of equality, even the terms of recognition or whatever you like, had already been set by the same itself. Okay? <laughs> okay, I come to recognize the existence of the Kurds, but under these and those and those and these conditions, etc. Okay. Okay. I will come to love the Turk, but under these and those and those conditions, etc. Okay. So this is what mutual recognition really implies. Okay. And don't forget these conditions are nothing else than the terms of that totality Levinas calls the same. Okay. <laughs> However. As sociologists, when we really think about the matter, we will find out that we will find out that in that exterior relationship to which we refer social, okay, there is something escaping this totalizing power of the same. Okay? If that was not the case, indeed, it would mean that once a certain power establishes itself, there would be no way to top it down. Okay? It would mean that the world would passively obey the dictates of that power. Okay? For instance, that power, I'm not necessarily talking about that political structures, etc. A relationship I am talking about between two friends, a relationship between wife and husband, Okay, that power of the husband, for instance, okay, if that relationship was capable of being fully determined by the desires, wishes, descriptions, understandings of one of the parties, that would not necessarily issue, you know, uh, uh, any place for negotiation, any room for negotiation, even struggle or whatever it is. Okay. And indeed, when we were concluding our discussions of postmodern theories, we have seen that they were coming to a point where resistance, where opposition increasingly turns out to be meaningless. Yeah, you oppose the capitalist system. Oh. What are you doing with this opposition? Oh. Trying to add a new axiomatic, say, in the Lausanne language. Trying to add a new axiomatic into the axiomatic system of capitalism so that the system may function better than it was functioning earlier. Okay? 
So actually, we should take it seriously and consider what Levinas has to say. Even though, my personally, I'm quite critical about Levinasian thinking, uh, especially in the times we find ourselves, I think that his criticism deserves serious consideration. Okay. So the ethical relationship then the ethical relationship is something according to Levinas which necessarily comes prior actually to any problem of understanding the world okay it is about it is a problem about living through the and in the world and among the others okay <laughs> And without this, the problem of knowing the others, the problem of knowing the world would not even pop up, okay? Without being able to live among the others within the world, the problem of knowing the world would cannot show itself up even, okay? So therefore, first philosophy according to Levinas, and we will see this last sentence that I'm about to express right now, would contain a very serious difficulty and contradiction for Levinas' thinking. First philosophy should be ethics. Okay? So what do we understand by ethics? According to Levinas, ethical relationship is the relationship with the other. Okay? And the other, not the other in me, but the other which is exterior and would forever remain exterior to me okay so ethical relationship actually methodologically speaking he resembles the ethical relationship uh, to the relationship with the idea of the infinity of God as it has been expressed by Descartes in his third meditation. Actually, the idea is not new, uh, originally known as Anselm's argument or uh, ontological argument, and Descartes gives an, another expression to this. Okay, the idea simply, it's a very simple idea. Okay, actually, and related with the problem of uh, proving the existence of God. Okay, how we can come to prove the existence of God. This is the problem, okay? And to be able to show this, Anselm developed an argument, okay? Later known as ontological proof or ontological argument, and Descartes adapts it here. It is this. I, as an individual finite being, have the idea of infinity of God in myself, okay? The problem with that infinity, the idea of infinity is that as a finite being myself, okay, this idea cannot come from experience, okay? Now, usually we tend to think that if we have any idea, for instance, an empiricist John Locke would tell you, okay, if we have any idea, okay, this idea should come from the experiences that we, are, we underwent while we are living, okay? I see this, I see this. I experienced chair several times, several times. Therefore, I come to constitute the idea of chair, okay? I experience other people, as establish social relationships. Therefore, I come to constitute the idea of other, an idea of the social relationships, etc. But the problem here is that there is no such empirical ground, so to speak, for the undeniable existence of the idea of infinity, if you like, in me. Okay? So from whence this idea of infinity comes, okay, Anselm's argument goes on to show that unless it has been put by God into us, we could not have that idea at all. Okay? So that since that we have that idea in us, this functions as the proof of the existence of God. Another important point in this discussion is related with the character of the infinity. Now, thinking about infinity or the experience, the very experience of having the idea of infinity in me, okay, I am a finite being. My thinking is finite and I am now, right now, dealing with the idea of infinity. How come? Huh? It appears that 
in thinking about the idea of infinity, there remains always something which exceeds the limits of my capacity for thinking. Okay? So it's a strange thing and a finite thinking containing an infinite thinking here. Okay? So Levinas would locate his notion of ethics in this relationship between the finite and the infinite. Okay? So now I am replacing the idea within the expression, the idea of the infinity of God, I am replacing God with the other. Okay? Now it is this excess, according to Levinas. This infinite element in the idea or in the other, the infinite element of the other, which cannot be brought into its fullness in my thinking, that establishes the priority of ethics in relation to ontology or metaphysics. Okay? This is why the ethical relationship exceeds the limits of the capacity of understanding on the part of the same. Okay? In other words, the same can never come to understand the infinitude in the other. Okay. The other now, as we have seen, shows itself in the world of the same. Okay. In other words, the same comes to the awareness of the existence of the other standing before him. Okay. So originally, actually, at, up to this point, there is not much distinction between the earlier ways of thinking and the living Asian way of thinking. Okay. No matter. Okay. The same or self or we, as the knowers of the world, first of all should be somehow aware of the existence standing there of something in front of us, okay, in front of us. Otherwise, where would I know that there is such a university at that certain location in Ankara? Hmm? If I didn't come across with it or if I didn't hear it from somebody else or if I didn't see its pictures uh, in a certain album or whatever, okay? So somehow it shows itself. And this showing itself, okay, according to Levinas, assumes the form of a call. Actually, just simple showing of the other is in the form of a call. Call for what? Call for a response. Okay? A response from the same. Okay? As you can imagine, this response can be anything at all, okay, friendly or hostile or whatever, okay, can take any form, whatever, <laughs> it doesn't matter. But this establishes a relationship of obligation on the part of the same, the self, or responsibility to respond to the other, okay. <laughs> so, well, let's I was here moving along with my intentionality or whatever it was, okay, in the world or my concernful dealings in the world or my quest to know the world, okay. So something appears before me which is not reducible, which proves itself to be not reducible to the status of my object. You cannot reduce it. Why? This human to human, or in Levinasian terms, face to face relationship, face to face relationship, actually this situation or structure of this very face to face relationship cancels out the reduction of the other to the status of an object. Simply because 
We are no longer in front of a stone, we are no longer in front of something else, but we are in front of another human being looking eye to eye each other. Okay. So, it is not something we read about in a certain book, it's not something, a faceless face in the crowd, okay? It is real, tangible human being confronting us, okay? It is this face-to-face -face confrontation, actually, which posits the requirement of responding, okay? It means that the same cannot ignore it or cannot put it away, okay? So that's the, actually, mm, how can I put it? The whole aim of such a philosophy uh, turns out to be quite political, as you can see, establishing a face-to-face -face and one-to-one -one relationship between the same and the other, okay? A humane relationship in contradistinction to anti-humanism of the 1970s or Heideggerian phenomenology, okay? Remember, in Heideggerian uh, analysis of Dasein, we have seen the other only when we, discussing, when we were discussing the fallenness of the Dasein, okay? The fallenness of the Dasein in the day self, okay? And day self, as the very title implies, was not a particular individual. Even Dasein, in it is authentic being, conversing with meaningful, engaging in meaningful conversation with another authentic Dasein, okay, they were not facing each other in the form of human beings. They were facing each other as Daseins, two Daseins, okay. But I, I, would say, I would add, the desire or the wish for such a thinking could be quite nice and good. Let's establish friendly relationships, humane relationships among ourselves. But the result could be quite the reverse. Okay, we will see, come to this point later on. Okay, so even though Levinas talks about the presence of the other in the formulation of the face-to-face -face relationship. Actually, this relationship is not visual, he says, okay? But rather linguistic. So what really goes on in the form of social interaction between the same and the other in this ethical relationship is the performative acts of speech, okay? Performances, whose importance we are gonna later come back to, okay? Well, okay, in the meantime, let's have a break. <laughs>